I was wondering if you could read us some of uh, Love Child. Right, right. Well, in fact, I thought uh, I would read the scene um, where um, Bill goes, uh, she's, this takes place in uh, 1935, um, and, um, oops, yes, um, she, she's still living at home, she's 27 years old, she's had this scandal in her past, so, so she's home, there are three girls, they're, uh, they don't have much money. The father's a diamond evaluator, but um, they have very little money. Uh, and so one day they see this advertisement in the paper, um, which is for uh, a nurse companion. And Bill has a sort of brief nursing degree. Um, and so the sisters say, well, why don't you apply? Um, and they dress her up, and they write a reference for her, uh, which is obviously a fake reference. Um, and they send her off. And she gets to the house and she's very surprised by her interview with the, with the, um, uh, the lady of the house, Helen, who uh, hires her on the spot. And she has no idea really what she's supposed to be doing there. Uh, and so this is the scene where Helen shows her to her room. Uh, and well, you'll see what happens next. Helen ushered Bill into her room, saying in a kind way, I hope you'll be happy here with us. It looked more like a suite than a room, with its vast view of the garden, romantic in the shadows of the twilight, the big comfortable bed with its many cushions and pillows under the wide window, and in an alcove, the bookcase with all the blue and maroon leather-bound books, a small blue silk-covered love seat, and the fold-down mahogany desk. There was even a bouquet of multicolored roses in a round glass vase and a lace doily on the dresser, a cotton dressing gown placed on the bed for her. That evening, she dined alone with Helen in the long dining room with its French doors that gave onto the garden, though a place had been set for the husband at the top of the mahogany table with a glittering silver and a bowl of white roses from the garden. He had not appeared. Sitting opposite her, Helen seemed nervous, crumbling the center of her roll into small balls, but not eating much. She picked fussily at the delicious roast lamb with green peas. She kept glancing at the door and at the corner cupboard in the dining room, as though it harbored a thief. She crumbled her linen napkin, rose from the table before the dessert, and drifted towards the door. Helen had that capacity to hover in life, not just in dreams. Bill thought she looked like an angel as she drifted towards the door, her hair shimmering, looking back over her shoulder, apologizing, putting her long bejeweled fingers to her forehead delicately. She claimed she had a migraine, and Bill offered to accompany her to her room, but she waved a fine hand and told her to finish her meal, leaving her alone at the long table. She sat in awkward silence, the cook moving about her with his abrupt, angry gestures, his face showing displeasure at serving her dessert. She was an intruder here. What was her work to be? All sorts of strange possibilities ran through her mind. Whatever the reason, the servant did not approve. Grudgingly, he brought her a small slice of delicious apple pie, punctuated with a comma of whipped cream, <laughs> followed by a demi tasse of bitter coffee so hot it burned her tongue. She didn't dare ask for sugar or milk. She was sprawled out in her bra and half petticoat after her long day when she heard the knock on her door. She was considering she might have made a mistake. She would probably just pack her suitcase and go home. The situation seemed too weird. She was on the wide bed lying under the fan which turned fast, stirring up the hot night air. She jumped up, fumbled her arm into the sleeve of the gown and opened the door a crack. The servant who had let her into the house and served dinner was standing there in his white starched uniform with the blood red sash across his chest. He informed her solemnly that the master was mating, waiting, <laughs> quiet, sorry, was waiting for her in his study. She dressed quickly and slipped quietly down the stairs. She'd already understood the need for discretion. She went through the hall and knocked on what she hoped was the study door. Come in, he said, in a low, pleasant voice, 
and she entered a dimly lit, book-lined and panel study on the west side of the house with a dark, heavy leather couch, a gramophone, and green, silver, and green velvet curtains. He was sitting in the shadows. She could hardly see his face, but gathered he was neat from the small stacks of paper on his desk. His cigar lit up his face and perfumed the room. In the green light of the desk lamp and the cigar's glow, she didn't find his face unattractive. Though he was clearly much older than she, <coughs> nearer her father's age, bright blue eyed and balding, the forehead high and white, the hair that remained silvery and neat. He looked uneasy and solemn as he stubbed out his cigar in the large glass ashtray and considered her. He didn't introduce himself, but asked her to shut the door. His expression was stern, but not indifferent. He was staring at her, consuming her with his gaze, traveling from her face to her feet, in pies, white shirt, that's a sister, and Hayes's dark skirt, somewhat rumpled at this point. She'd not had time to brush her hair or put on lipstick, and glancing down, she realized she'd done up the buttons on the blouse wrong, so that it gaped. She'd seen men stare at her like this before, but that wasn't what he was looking for. He was looking for something particular. Embarrassed, she forced herself to meet his gaze when he inquired about her age. She considered telling him it was none of his business, or diminishing it, as she sometimes did, but thought that age might be an advantage here. She confessed she was 27. She was accustomed to people who didn't know her, giving her some compliment about her looks and expressing wonderment at her availability, something she would ignore if she could. A beauty like you and not married yet? You must be a difficult woman, they said with a teasing smile. But he didn't smile and only said after a pause, good, not too young or impressionable, I gather, and not too easily persuaded a remark which seemed incomprehensible and rude. He went on, unperturbed by her silence. My wife tells me you have a good reference. She would have liked to tell him. It was up to him to find out. But she simply nodded and continued to stare back into his avid, intelligent eyes. Anyway, she likes you, and that's the main thing here, he said, grinning in a surprisingly frank, youthful, and mischievous way. She could see he had a sense of humor, a fun. Also, there was a glimmer of complicity in his blue eyes. She felt he knew all about her, had immediately guessed her secrets, the subterfuge, the false reference, or something about her, past, that would be useful to him. The youthful indiscretion, the love affair, perhaps a scandal. Still, she felt at ease. There was no need to pretend. She moved a little closer to his desk, twisted her wide, gold slave brace at her arm and smiled at him. Are you able to get up early in the morning and keep my wife company until eight or nine in the evening when I get back from work? I don't want her to be alone for a moment. I'm an early riser. I'd be happy to keep her company, she said. She didn't think Helen would be bad company and she was used to continuous presence of others, enjoyed it even. She thought this man must have realized that she had that his wife was lonely in their huge house and garden. She was touched by his solicitude. What a thoughtful, loving husband. She presumed the advantage of being rich was that you could pay for companionship. Good, he said. Then he stretched out a hand with something in it and whispered, I'm going to give these to you. I'm away so much of the time because of my work and naturally I cannot rely on the servants to have the authority. For a moment he hesitated, closed his fist and put it to the cleft in his chin. She moved a little closer to him in the shadowy room to see what he had there as he said, I suppose you're not the sort of person who loses things. No, she said, because until then she'd not had many things to lose, though she had once lost the most essential. The family had no car, she had no jewelry to speak of, Though she'd always kept, wrapped up carefully in tissue paper in a drawer, an amber necklace from Isaac. But in their house, none of their doors locked, even the outhouse had no lock. He opened up his hand and named each of the keys on the ring, 
the pantry cupboards, for the store cupboards, for the servants' bin of Melibia, for the flower bin, for the liquor cabinet, and the dining room. All of them? Is this necessary? She asked, coming closer, hesitating, trying to understand. He pressed the key ring firmly into the palm of the hand and folded her small fingers over it with his warm, strong ones, clapping her fingers shut. She recalled the clock giving Isaac the big key to the room in the old hotel and felt a little shudder run through her body as he said, you must keep the doors locked. It's important, you understand? His own wife, she thought, beginning to comprehend. He doesn't trust his own wife. He let her hand go and she took the keys from him and stood looking down on them, each one with its identifying tag, neatly marked in blue ink. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's so hard to remember these things. I, I, I don't think I did a lot of rewriting, but I may have done some, but really it was quite, you know, because it, there is this forward story and there are these flashbacks, so I could just, you know, start uh, at the beginning with the first thing and just take it through. Uh, but, um, I mean, there is that whole question of flashback, which I'm sure for the writers in the room as well that we, you know, all struggle with. Uh, and I had this experience recently of having a, um, a film made from a book in which, similar to this, I had written a book with uh, starting uh, at the end with a, a reunion of a, um, a group of women who come back to school uh, for a reunion. And then I flashed back, one of them's missing, and then I flashed back to what had happened. Now when the film was made, uh, the young director, uh, for whatever reason, decided to get rid of the flashback. And she starts uh, in the school when the girls are 12 or 13, and in sachets the teacher, who is, you know, that they're all adore, and walks up the um, aisle of the chapel. So you could say, well, I, I, I didn't know why she had made this decision. It may have been an economic decision there. Simply, you know, don't, you don't have to have those older actresses and the younger ones. Uh, so there's that, you know, and then she created suspense in other ways. Um, but, uh, you know, by starting at the end, you hope to uh, create the suspense that will maybe hold the reader to kind of follow along as you flash back and forth. And then another film that I saw recently, and maybe some of you saw too, which was Jane Eyre, uh, and that, interestingly, I don't know if you saw it, Ed, but it's, it's, they start in the middle of Jane Eyre. They start when she runs away from Thornfield, you know, after the debacle of the, of the marriage. And that's where the, this very good, I thought, modern film begins. So there, then they flash back. So, I don't know these things. It's, who knows what, what the, what the answer but, but I, is. I to. in this book of yours that the, <laughs> Uh, that the objections we sometimes have to flashbacks wouldn't hold. I mean, uh, I think a bad flashback is where you're reading along and you, and then all of a sudden you have a, you have four or five pages interpolated from a much earlier period, and that's not part of the structure of the book. Right. But here you 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 start e each of the very short chapters with a date. And, and some of them are in the 20s, and then the alternating ones are in the 50s. And it's quite clear that this is the form of the book. So it isn't really annoying in the way that, that flashbacks can be. Oh, yes, I suppose there is always a kind of nostalgia for our childhood, right? Uh, and that's probably why I continue to write about South Africa because there is obviously that richness of imagination that one had as a child. Uh, and I suppose one turns back to that uh, as a writer. And it's always a rich vein to mine. Uh, and obviously you can't you know, get stuck there for too long. <laughs> but certainly some of, the, some of the best writing probably that we do does come out of those moments. And, and you and your stories have used some of that mm -hmm. and very evocatively. Uh, so, yes.
Well, I mean, I guess I don't make too much of a meal out of it. I mean, I sort of, uh, I think it's fine that uh, if people are interested for any reason, I'm happy. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, um, but, well, I, I, I mean, if the truth is that when you write a, a novel, well, even if it's very autobiographical, you, it does give you a tremendous freedom to change things around, uh, to, work, to sort of sort out the chronology and smooth it up. To if you had seven lovers that summer, you make it two <laughs> because it's more plausible. And, uh, and uh, you, you know, I think in general you try to uh, 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 smooth out the the eccentricity. I mean, I think that that's what I found in writing real autobiographies like uh, My Lives and uh, City Boy, and then writing these other earlier autobiographical novels is that in the novels, um, I tried to make the character more representative of some more typical, because I feel that's sort of the burden of fiction. In other words, if you, let's say you were very precocious as a child, both sexually and intellectually, well, that will alienate most readers, and it certainly will make them not be able to identify with the character. So you better sort of dumb him down a bit or something, to make him seem more representative. But then when you finally come to write your a real proper autobiography, you can feel free to put in all the weirdnesses uh, and eccentricities that you actually possess. Because that's all you're that's what you're saying you're doing is you're saying this is me, this is what I really lived through. Does, you, you look quizzical about this, too. does it not make sense? Um, I'm not alienated by sexual orientation. I see. Well, I mean, I guess, that the, the, but, but I think in the case of my writing, uh, since I was, I'm a gay writer, and I was one of the first to write about, well, not really, but at least in this way, you've, I was one of the first to write about gay experience. I think that, that I felt an extra burden, which I'm sure uh, a black writer in the 50s would have felt, or a Jewish writer in the 60s would have felt, that a, a need to, w without, without bending too much to the pressure to make your character likable or a role model. Uh, on the contrary, I, I, I oftentimes emphasized how difficult and, and alienated they were. But on the other hand, I did want to write for other people. I, I mean, I think if you're a gay writer writing in the 1960s and 70s, you, you, you definitely felt that pressure to, uh, and it was a good, healthy kind of pressure, not one that you were uh, bending to, but that you were accepting and using as a, as a springboard for doing uh, good work. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I, I see what you're saying too, is that in fiction, we have to certainly condense and perhaps simplify a little bit. Uh, I, I'm not saying you have to stereotype, but you do, you can't sometimes put down all the complexity of human nature in a, in a novel, and I'm sure you, you know this too, Patty. Uh, but so you, you have to kind of, um, to, to make the character accessible for the reader, which is what you're, a little bit what you're saying, yeah, perhaps. I mean, when, you, you when, have to simplify. When we were starting out writing, people always said, don't describe the main character too much. Because if you say she's got bright red hair, then people who have dark hair won't be able to identify with that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you remember those days? <laughs> but but I mean, you can sort of see the principle. Yeah. Well, well, yes. You 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 want to make the the character both very particular, so that the reader will believe in the character. But you also want to make the character universal to some extent, so that that enough people will recognize themselves in the, uh, yeah. in the character on the page. So it's a little bit People ask me this, and it's so hard to remember when a book began, you know, because in some ways the, a book begins when you're born, in a way, and particularly this one, because, uh, you know, being based somewhat on my mother's life. But the actual writing of it probably took about two years. And as for working on other things, well, uh, you know, I was um, certainly doing other things like teaching and, uh, and also writing some short stories. I do do that. I like to do that. 
uh, at the but same time. But take it from me, Sheila's a fiendish writer. I mean, you, you write it on the train with her from prison, and she's scribbling away. She's writing a whole novel. <laughs> she's, it, it's something in the air out there. We have Joyce Carol Oates, now we have Sheila Cole. <laughs> well, no, but the train is a good place to write, actually, because there's no internet, you know, so you really can get things done. Although, I have to say, coming back from on that ride back, five o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know that I was very often writing. I was mostly nodding off the <laughs> yes.